Hello, my name is John Orr, and my topic is how does the church keep its new Christians? Well, when people are baptized into Christ, we form a circle and we sing, bind us together, or we may have them stay after church and everyone comes and greets them. And we may send them a book of some kind, and it's a time of great rejoicing. In Luke chapter 15, the Bible tells us about the sheep that the shepherd found, the coin that the woman found, and the prodigal son that came home to his father. And so we rejoice with them. In fact, this picture of the shepherd with the sheep was actually the first symbol that Christians used to identify Christianity beside the ichthus or the little fish sign. And uh, it referenced Jesus Christ being the true shepherd. Now, when we measure success of a year, or when someone measures success of a congregation, we usually ask, how many baptisms have you had? And people will respond, well, we've had none all the way to we've had a hundred. But are baptisms really a true measure of success? Sometimes we focus too much on numbers and not on measures in order to see how successful we are as a Lord's church. The Lord's work only begins at baptism. Just so you'll know, because sheep tend to stray and will also follow wherever they are led, shepherds often had to discipline those lambs that would stray from their shepherds, especially more than once. The shepherd would use his rod to break the leg of a wandering lamb. After binding the break, the shepherd would carry the lamb on his shoulders while the wound healed. God breaks us down with his word and then builds us back up to the point to where we die, we are buried, and we are resurrected with Jesus Christ. That is the happy rejoicing but happier still is the work that just begins after they are baptized. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. If we want Jesus to be with us in the church, we not only need to go and make disciples, but we also need to teach them to observe all things whatsoever the Lord commanded us. It's passed down from generation to generation. In the church of Christ, we have stayed to the same pattern, for almost 2,000 years. And our priority in the church is to make disciples. To make disciples in order to bring them into Christ and to continue to make disciples in order to keep them in Christ. You see, disciple making is not about sharing the gospel with people and then leaving them to figure out the Christian life on their own. Instead, we must show them how to follow Christ on a day-to-day -day basis. Years ago, when I went to preaching school, my wife had a class, and I stayed home with the kids. We didn't have a lot of food in the pantry, and usually we got our food from the church pantry, and we had some pumpkin there, and I thought, you know something, I think I can make a pumpkin cake. And so I got the pumpkin uh, contents out of the can, and I mixed it together with flour 
and with sugar, and I mixed it together with some spices and some other stuff, and I put it in the oven, and I let it set and set and set, and finally had to pull it out before it burned it. Wasn't rising very well. When my wife got home, I was excited about her taking the first bite. She did, and she looked at me, and she says, what ingredients did you put in this to make this cake? And I told her, and she said, did you put in any baking powder? And there was silence, and I said, no, I forgot. And we used that pumpkin cake to dribble it all the way to the trash can <laughs> because that's all it was good for. You see, in making that cake, I didn't use all the ingredients. And so when we're making disciples, we need to use all of the ingredients. What is a disciple? A disciple is a student usually chosen by a master. In Jesus' day, the master would choose the best candidates as a disciple to follow him around, and he would pay for the disciple's expenses, and the disciple, you might say, would be his servant, but he would also be his student and would follow him around everywhere. We, in like fashion, are chosen by God, Ephesians chapter 1 for and following. We are chosen in him. It's not who we are, but where we are, and that is in Christ Jesus. By being chosen to be in him, that means we become his disciple. And so when we teach others about being disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to remember who the master is. They are not our disciples. They are disciples of Jesus Christ. Does it stop at baptism? No. No, it goes much farther than that. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 and 4 that we are chosen in him, but we are chosen to be holy and blameless in him. So Jesus teaches us to how to be holy and blameless. In a holy and blameless life <coughs> excuse me, is, is so much more important than just dunking them and then junking them, as one person said. We continuing to teach them to be holy and blameless is a job that never ends. Should it start before baptism? It should. We need to teach them what a Christian is, what a disciple is. We need to ask them, if you decide to be baptized into Christ, what would you do afterwards? Where would you be on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Do you plan to study the Bible every day? What kind of disciple are you going to be? Well, what are the essential needs of a new Christian? Well, for one thing, they must love. Verse 9 of Romans 12, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Not only should the church practice this with other members of the church, but they also need to practice it immediately with the new Christian you're making a disciple of Christ, not just baptizing them, but teaching them. And you do that by being sincere with them, to be devoted to them in love, by honoring them above yourself and your needs. 
by being zealous, by serving the Lord, by being joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and sharing if they are in need, and definitely practicing hospitality. So you need those ingredients, plus also I would throw in a healthy portion of being in the Word. John 8, 31, 32, if you are my, said, if you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Then throw in uh, being a fruit bearer from John chapter 15, and being faithful in John, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider how to stimulate one another unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, followed by the icing on the cake, and that is John 13 and 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. These are essential needs of the Christian. New Christians, you see, are babes in Christ. Hebrews 5 talked to the Hebrews in the churches around and he said in verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We have too many babies in the church. We have too many people that sit in the easy chair and let other people do the work. We have a problem in the church today called the 80-20 syndrome where 80% of the work and the giving is done by 20% of the people. Folks, we have to cure that. Our new Christians are going to come into the church and they're going to see too many lazy people, too many gripers and whiners, and it's going to turn them off and they'll be leaving the church instead of staying. They need to come in and see a loving church, a fruitful church, a patient church, a hospitable church, a healthy church, a loving church, and a church that puts its focus in its faith in Jesus Christ and his word. They need to see that. They need to be taught that. Or otherwise, they'll either just continue to be babes like our 80% or they'll fall away. Acts 2 and chapter 42 is a foundational passage of scripture. It says of the early church that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. Just as the early church thought it most important to focus on these things, so must we focus on it as a church and to help our new Christians focus on it as well. To begin with, they need daily Bible study. The Bible says they continued in the apostles' doctrine. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit would give the apostles their doctrine. And they passed that on to the brethren. And they would continue to study daily. And they would work together. I encourage you to study every day yourself. And to share your findings with your fellow brothers and sisters at worship. Also, instead of talking about 
a sports team or what you're going to do next week or where you're going on vacation, spend time talking with new Christians about what was said in the message or what they've studied during the week. You need to have almost immediate Bible study with someone when they come up out of the water. Set up a study and go through something like the Foundations for Disciples, a 17-lesson series put out by Home Mission, and you can get that free. You can order it free. And I would also uh, follow up with other things once you've finished that. There are, uh, there are also articles that they can get every week called 50 Ways to Love the Father. There are CDs they can listen to called The Greatness of the Lord's Church. And all that is provided free by Home Mission. There are other good uh, works out there that you can use or make up your own. But they need study immediately. Just continue your Bible study time that you had with them where you brought them to Christ and then continue on and go on with them. If they do not obey the gospel after you present an evangelistic method, then go right into the foundations and usually by the fourth or fifth lesson, they will obey the gospel. Then you need to continue in fellowship. John says in 1 John 1 and 7, if we walk in the light, we have, uh, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ cleanses us, that is continually cleanses us of our sins. If we don't have the fellowship with one another, the blood of Christ becomes of no avail to us. Excuse me. You can't have fellowship by sitting at home seven days a week. You have fellowship by meeting together as often as the church meets, meeting in the homes and having Bible study, having devotionals with your family, or Bible studies with your friends and neighbors. Some people say, I just don't have time for that. Then I would have to say, if you're too busy to do the Lord's work, then you're too busy. You need to make time. Maybe start with one night a week. Find some time during the day to study the Bible. Work out your schedule so that you can be here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and during other special activities. We always told our children to pick out one at the most two activities you want to be involved in with school because we do not want you to miss the activities of the youth or of the church. Sometimes it can't be avoided, but we want you, we want you to know what is most important in our life because when you graduate from school, those things are not going to be as nearly as important as being faithful to God and having fellowship with the believers. That's what we want you to do. And that's what we need to teach our new Christians to do. Because if they go back to having fellowship with people in the world, they'll go back to the world. I knew one young man that was just on fire for God. He even went out and he taught I don't know how many people couple of dozen people to come to Christ but he couldn't get away from the world he couldn't get away from smoking marijuana and because of that he kept going back and finally he fell away and every once in a while he'll come back to worship service and say I'm going to start all over again and then he goes back and has fellowship with those people you have to have a whole new list of friends sometimes or convert your friends to Jesus Christ. Fellowship is important because it's friendship, it's kinship, it's oneship. It's these things that put us on the same ship with Jesus Christ as our captain. Fellowship is important to the new Christian and to everyone in the church. Next, the breaking of the bread. This is the direct reference 
to what uh, Luke referred to in Acts 20 and verse 7, that upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them. The centerpiece of the Christian worship was the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the fruit of the vine or of the grape. The Old Testament calls it the blood of the grape. The bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. The cup represents the blood of Christ. And so as we partake of communion upon the first day of the week, the Bible says that Jesus partakes it with us. He said, I will not drink this cup with you again until I drink it anew with you when I come into the kingdom. And when the Laodiceans began to fall away from Jesus in their heart, Jesus said in Revelation 3 to the Laodiceans, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open that door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. What did he mean? Well, the word sup is short for supper. I'll come in and I'll commune with him if he'll let me into their hearts. Now, he was talking to Christians in that passage of Scripture, not outsiders. Communion is a very special time where we not only commune with Jesus, but we also fellowship with one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us, is not the bread the fellowship of the body of Christ? Is not the cup the fellowship of the blood of Jesus Christ? You can't just take it at home all the time. I know we've been through a pandemic and we've had to shut services down some and people have stayed at home because they were afraid to come. But now that we're getting back at, at it, some people decide, well, you know, I'll just stay at home and I'll just keep getting communion and, and I'll watch the sermon on TV and, and I'll be okay, but it's not okay. It's not okay. We're commanded, as we said, saw earlier in Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. I knew an individual one time that was dying with cancer. When he couldn't physically come, he had his children bring him on a stretcher Sunday morning so that he could fellowship in communion with his brothers and sisters in Christ. Think about how committed and faithful that brother was. Is that not the kind of people that Jesus wants to commune with? Does he commune with you when you're not fellowshipping with the brethren? I know there are special circumstances, but folks, we need to work it out where we can be with the brethren on the first day of every week. And we especially need our new Christians to be here every time the doors with open is open and then finally praying without ceasing or prayer prayer without ceasing comes from 1 Thessalonians 5 and everything give thanks pray without ceasing for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus our life needs to be one continual prayer to God when you study God's word pray back to him what you've learned it doesn't have to be a lengthy prayer. You can just thank him for waking up in the morning. Thank him for the good night's sleep. Thank him for all for blessing the food or blessing the food when you eat. Don't be ashamed if you're out in public. How terrible it is when people are ashamed to pray in public. And Pray when you're happy. Pray when you're sad. Pray when you're trying to lead someone to Christ. Pray without ceasing. Prayer needs to fill the life of the believer just as much as Bible study does. And they know go hand in hand. 
Someone explained it to me this way when I was a little boy. If you're talking on the telephone to someone and they can't hear what you're saying, but you can hear what they're saying, then you can't complete a conversation. So studying the Bible is listening to God and prayer is God listening to you. And the most important component in prayer is bending your will to the will of God. When you ask for something, always follow it with two words. So that. Lord, I need a new job. Why? So that I can be at services every time. I've been in situations like that in the past, and I prayed for it, and God has ultimately answered my prayer. If you want it bad enough, God will help you find it. And in dealing with new Christians, don't give up until they bear fruit. Your new Christians may be your best soul winners because they have so many different contexts that you don't. Friends, relatives, loved ones, contacts, and so on. Don't give up till they bear fruit, till they grow up and mature in the Lord and can learn to hold a Bible study themselves. It doesn't take years to do that. It may take a few weeks or a couple of a few months, but have that as your goal so that they can bear fruit. Jesus talks about the fact that he's the vine and we're the branches and no one can bear fruit without him. And he has commanded us to go and bear fruit. And if we don't bear fruit, he's going to take us and take these branches that don't bear fruit and throw them in the fire. We don't want that. We don't want to work so hard on Christians, bring them to be baptized, and then not teach them and equip them to teach their friends and loved ones. We have to do that because the more fruit they bear, the more faithful they'll be. It may take years with some new Christians. They may be up and down like a a yo-yo. They may come very faithfully for a while and then back off. They may just come on Sunday mornings for a while and then start on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. If you'll be patient with them and not demand, over-demand things, they'll be faithful. And if they fall away, go to them immediately. They may have problems. I know of times when people have said ugly things to new Christians I know one time when we had a greeting line and one man came up to an individual and said, stay away from my ex-wife or I'll kill you. Well, ultimately that man fell away because he couldn't get that out of his mind. What a horrible thing to say. That man was only looking out for his own needs and not the needs of that new Christian. The new Christian was just friends of that woman. And it wasn't even his wife anymore. But it may take years of never giving up on people to finally get them to where they're in the groove of following God and doing what God says. Stay involved with them. And it is most important to get them involved. At the end of every lesson on foundations for disciples, there's an involvement section. And through the 17 lessons, there are 17 ways to get involved gradually. We need to get them involved in teaching or co-teaching, the men to wait on the table or to say a prayer or to even speak or lead singing or whatever it may be. We need to get all of them in singing, teach them how to sing. Let them sit by us and teach them how to sing parts. Let them sing with us to be acquainted with the songs, give them CDs with songs on it or show them where to find it on Spotify and put together a list of acapella music to listen to. It may take years, but we can't give up one single Sunday because the devil will try to get them back. We just can't give up. Satan won't give up. 
and God will hold us accountable if we give up. Finally, if they do fall away, then we need to, we need to give them something to come back to. The Bible says in Acts 3 and 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshment or refreshing may come from the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? I love the word refreshing. I taught a t-ball team one time and there was this big kid that always asked before he started practicing, Coach, are we going to have refreshments today? People love to be refreshed. And if, and if a Christian falls away, he's tired, his heart is broken, he may be afraid, he's hurting, someone probably has hurt his feelings, he's disappointed in what other people are doing. If they fall away, we need to be a church that's a place of refreshment and love. If they walk back through the door, every person in the building needs to go and hug them and tell them that they love them and that they miss them. We need to give gifts to those who have fallen away and we need to give gifts to those who have been baptized. We need to give gifts. We need to treat them just like we treat our own families. And we need to love them and care for them, meet their needs or whatever they may have. We can't afford to lose one soul, folks, not one soul. Upon one occasion, this scripture really sticks with me. Upon one occasion, Jesus accused the Pharisees of being hypocrites by saying, you compass land and sea to make one proselyte and then you make him twofold the son of hell than yourselves. Could that not also apply to those that we go out and knock doors and work hard to bring to Christ and then let them down to fall away and not be taught? We make them worse than they were before if they come into Christ and we allow them to fall away. Don't ask the elder or the preacher where someone is. You go out and find out. You text them or call them. And don't do it in a hateful way or a stern way. Do it with love. Just tell them you miss them. Ask them how their day is going. Hope to see them Sunday. Never give up on them. Send them a card. Whatever you can do. Pray with them. Love them. Help them. Be a refreshment to your new Christians, to all those who have fallen away, and all those among us that are struggling, that have lost loved ones, and are alone. Let this church be a season, a spring of refreshment. And we will be to our new Christians what God wants us to be. Thank you.